And our first speaker is Kristen Wiesenen from Rosalind Franklin. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Let me know if you can't. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. And as um, uh, as our moderator, Caroline, mentioned, I'm at Rosalind Franklin University now, which is a graduate school in North Chicago um, that only has medicine, pharmacy, um, nursing, podiatry, so just has health professions um, within that. It's I'm going to have to lean forward, I think, to get to this. So don't forgive me for leaning on the table. Um, so I'm, we're going to catch up a little bit during this time, um, and we're going to focus really on education, both at the at the PharmD or at the uh, medical school level, all the way up through educating health professions about pharmacogenomics. mix. And I know I've been in clinical implementation and education of pharmacogenomics for about 12 years now. And I know from a lot of experience that education is not very sexy. Like this is not something that, that people usually want to fund or you're talk much about. But I, I'm going to tell you why I think it's really, really important. And so um, essentially almost all of the implementation barrier publications cite education as one of the key barriers to implementation. And so if we're going to be able to make this work in a, a standardized way within the health systems, what we've been talking about, or within any app, um, environment, we really have to focus on education because it really is an important component overall of implementation. Um, so I'm starting in the beginning. As I said, I'm talking about um, pharmacy school and medical school and other undergraduate and graduate medical education. And um, so my first slide is from Star Wars, and it says a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So we're not going that far back, <laughs> but, but we are going back to the beginning to think about wh where we can first begin to impact students when they're in their educational stages. And so um, from, um, so what I focused on pharmacy and medical schools together. So within pharmacy schools, um, the accreditation standards for pharmacy education include um, two statements within their kind of model curricular content on pharmacogenomics. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is in the uh, basic pharmaceutical sciences section, and one is in the clinical section, which is really a big deal. If you maybe eight or nine years ago, they were only in the basic sciences section. And so when that began, it recognized really that we need to move this into the clinical space. And then there are updated competencies that. Um, um, uh, Roseanne Donnelly, not Gamal, or Gamal, and, uh, and Phil and Filet, um, along with some others that probably in this room, that there are 30 competencies divided into two separate areas, foundational genetics and clinical implementation. And so between those two, it's a really great group. Now, something to think about is, is that we have two statements in the ACPE standards, we have 30 competencies. So standards don't necessarily equal competencies, and I think we need to begin to think about how we can create competency-based statements for, for all health professions. In the area of medicine, it's really based on what is um, put forth by the American uh, Society of Professors of Human Genetics. Um, they put a paper forward, and I think it was just recently updated in 2022, as a statement on what um, undergraduate education is needed for uh, medical genetics and genomics. And two of those statements, out of ironically 30, um, also include pharmacogenomics. And so, um, so we have probably more of an emphasis within the accreditation standards for pharmacy than we do for medicine, but it is included within the medical uh, content. The goal for uh, medical schools is three to four hours, um, really is all they get through, um, through medical school about pharmacogenomics, and up to 10 hours per term for, uh, for medical genetics and genomics. So if we think about medical school, what we see is that Although 86% um, of medical schools include uh, pharmacogenetics in their or pharm genomics and genetics in their curriculum, which is up from about 82% about 10 years ago, so it is an increasing number. However, the um, it's not necessarily to the extent that we want to see it. So. Um, there's a small number to overall total, and it's not necessarily incorporate inclusive of every medical school. Um, the most common uh, topics that are covered are cardiology and psychiatry. And then the most common genes are CYP2D6, CYP2C19, and CYP2C9. Um, and that doesn't necessarily match up. And because, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that one of the more common topics is also hypersensitivity. So you would think those genes would match up, but there were two different studies. And one, one looked at gene information, one looked at topics covered. And so they're really hitting the right places from a topic area. Um, I think it's just not necessarily um, hitting everything that we would want for, for any healthcare professional to know. 
Now, the good thing about pharmacy is that 100% of pharmacies, when, they, when they're surveyed, because it's in the accreditation standards now, 100% of pharmacy schools include pharmacogenomics in their curriculum. And so it's very well established within the, the pharmacy curriculum. And so what we're going to focus on is the different teaching and learning methods. And so how do they teach it now that we really established it in all schools and colleges? So what we'll focus on in, in the area of pharmacy is, um, is teaching and learning methods. And so what we find there is kind of what you would expect. First of all, there's a lot of different teaching methods, um, didactic being the most foundational, and nearly all schools of pharmacy employ didactic, which has been shown to be effective for retaining foundational knowledge. Um, you can also, they also looked at whether or not schools employ uh, personal genotyping or mock genotyping and, uh, or using a mock database. And, um, personal genotyping is effective in, in, in engagement with students and also helping them to remember and, and respect the patient's view for that. Um, but I think it's been applied in so many different ways that we don't really have a standardized way to approach that. And there's also the cost um, that is associated with that. And so um, interprofessional education is kind of an emerging area within the colleges of pharmacy that really has some advantages missing out that we need and has been shown to be associated with the absolute most uh, uh, effective teaching and retention and understanding long-term um, is really practice-based teaching. And so most didactic lectures incorporate cases, and cases are great. Um, so that's definitely a, an important component, but seeing this in practice is what students really need. So uh, Roseanne also did a, a look at uh, the Ameri the advanced clinical experiences for pharmacogenomics in the nation, and she found that 30% of schools and colleges offer, approximately 30%, offer, but they're really limited by the number of pharmacists that are actively engaging in clinical pharmacogenomics. And so, so one thing that I took out of this is that we really do need to equip our non-pharmacogenomics specialists to imp incorporate naturally their pharmacogenomics in their area into that rotation structure to help our students get continued exposure to how we're using pharmacogenomic data in practice. So there's a really good... Um, depiction of a model of how we might approach this. And it basically is matching the teaching uh, style to the learning outcome. And that's kind of a foundational aspect of, um, of, of teaching period. And so it makes sense. Um, the area that's left out most commonly is in the LC area. So ethical, legal, and social implications. And so, so that's where we really want to make sure we're hitting that with students and, and with pharmacists and also with every other profession. So, so that's kind of the basic landscape. I'll make sure I didn't miss anything, but we're doing better in medical schools, but still only about three to four hours total of curricular time devoted to pharmacogenomics. We're doing better in pharmacy schools than we were 10 years ago or even five years ago, but we are still looking at more of foundational didactic than practice-based coursework. One study looked at whether or not students retain information from their first year through their fourth year. So they had been exposed in their first year. And um, by the fourth year, 50% of them didn't know what CPIC was, could not identify what CPIC was. And so this is something we need to continually repeat in these, um, in these groups. And so, so where I really looked at this was within what the landscape is currently, are, we see what, are, what is emerging as a, a more defined model. And so, and that's really in the area of interprofessional education. And so interprofessional education is learning about, from, with other students. And what we really see is that pharmacogenomics is led by an interprofessional team, I, period. There's no way you can do pharmacogenomics with one discipline at all. And so incorporating that as a component of the educational aspect is a really great, um, you know, way to teach health professions their roles within that space. And so there are three different studies that look at interprofessional models of education. The first one being um, one where they were really interesting. They were all designed differently. And I was telling Chris Cruz ahead of time is what I ultimately think is that we've reached a point now where pharmacists are well-educated, pharmacists are established as leaders. If you look on the CPIC website, more than 50% of the implementers are pharmacists, are led by that group, and they've been repeatedly identified as have, being in that space. Um, and so we know that pharmacists in practice are leaders. And so I think we need to really think about how do we establish in our learners' minds what this model looks like. And so the, the three different studies of interprofessional education were very interesting because they all were slightly different. Um, the first one, I think, is it was a, uh, something that was optional for, I think, 
M1, med I can't remember M3, but medical students, but it was an optional exercise for medical students, it was required for pharmacy. And there was one or two um, medicine, medicine students with a group of six to eight pharmacy students. And they worked through a case together and, um, and then went um, and then both contributed to. And so the pharmacists, pharmacy students' role in that study was actually to educate the medical students. And they had difficulty engaging um, the medical students because it wasn't required for them. It was, it was required for the pharmacy students, but not for the medical students. They were also at different levels in some of these studies. And so it um, really emphasizes that there needs to be equal buy-in from, from both groups because the, the feedback for that study was the pharmacists felt, or pharmacy students felt that they did most of the, the heavy lifting. Another study done uh, by David Kaiser at Manchester University, and I also think with, um, with another school that <laughs> is escaping me now, um, it um, looked at a three-hour exercise where in the first hour they did a group discussion of five patient cases with medical and pharmacy students. And then they actually broke out and it was really, it was interesting, it incorporated prescription writing. And so they, um, the medical students focused on diagnosis. I think it was a sickle cell case. The medical students focused on diagnosis and the pharmacy students focused on pain management. So they, they broke out into groups and each one looked at their respective areas. And then they came back and the medical students taught the pharmacy students about sickle cell disease and the pharmacy students taught the medical students about, um, about pharmacogenomics. And so I think that's a really great way to approach it is a case where you're gonna have a disease and drug therapy that are both amenable to learning for both students. And they also have the ability to learn from each other. Um, there's a third model that has some similarities to those and also some differences. <laughs> and that's, that's all I'm gonna say for now, secret. And so, <laughs> So, so that's kind of the emerging trends within. And I really believe in the importance of interprofessional education. All right, so, so here's our first statement about our competencies. Um, I think I got most of these in there. And um, so just to add in pharmacy school, 50% offered that as a standalone required course, 30% um, as part of other courses. Um, most of it is taught still by basic sciences faculty, although up to 50% by clinical faculty. So here's our comparison of teaching and learning methods where we already kind of identified practice-based as being kind of the biggest need and interprofessional as a growing trend. And then this was that great picture I told you about <laughs> that showed how to integrate across the learning spectrum, which really I think is an, a great way to, to approach this, is kind of spiraling through the curriculum within pharmacogenomics. And I know we haven't done that yet at Rosalind Franklin. To some extent we have, um, but I think that's really a great way to approach it. And then increasing each year. And then you don't also have that problem that we talked about in our first year by the time we graduate we don't remember who CPIC is. So this is one slide I forgot. So the outcome of that education, are we creating practice-ready pharmacists and physicians? No. We're creating pharmacists and physicians who have continually a high interest and think that this is a great idea and it's going to be an important aspect of the future of medical care, but they don't know how to use it. So that there's something missing in that educational piece where they're still not, even though we've made this progress, they're still not leaving the room with this confidence to use this information in practice. And so as I mentioned, this is the first study we talked about, um, and this is the, the Manchester uh, study, and then the last one that I was just getting to is at Fair State and Western Michigan University, and this was a telehealth. This was interesting, too, because a lot of pharmacy schools don't have medical schools, or medical schools have pharmacy schools at the same institution, and so they uh, combined two different institutions and did the same exercise generally by telehealth, and it did work and increased um, medical student support for um, pharmacist qualifications and expertise. They recognized more of the pharmacist role and also affected um, their uh, knowledge about pharmacogenomics. Now, the other emerging trend that, is, that we're seeing now is increasing pharmacogenomics education for other health professionals. And so specifically uh, genetic counselors, and I know we have genetic counselors here, and many of us work with them both in the clinic or in the academic setting, but this is something that's um, increasing. So there's a survey done of uh, program administrators at genetic uh, counselor training programs, so in schools, and they said that 50% have a genetic counselor affiliated with their program that provides pharmacogenomics. Um, nearly 60% have a non-genetic counselor that's involved at the school, and almost all stated that genetic counseling programs really maxes out at seven hours. So they, they want to know about it. It is a required component of their curriculum. It's in their competency standards, um, but they kind of do the just the crunch of time, don't have a lot of time for that. But Eight, greater than 80% of those um, genetic counseling training program administrators agreed that genetic counselors should be able to provide pharmacogenomic care, either uh, independently or with uh, in conjunction with a pharmacist. And so we're seeing increasing importance placed on in other health professions, one being 
uh, genetic uh, counseling. And then what we see in nursing is not, hold on one second, I lost my mouse. What we see in nursing is, is not as pronounced as what we see in um, genetic training or, or genetic counselor training programs. So it's really not integrated. There are genetic and genomic competencies that were done by um, Catherine Calzone, I think, many, many years ago um, from at NIH and HGRI, but there's limited mention of pharmacogenomics at all in the accreditation standards. So I think that's a big opportunity when we look at other health professions. Another opportunity that we have. So this, this was something that I've learned about more in the last few years. We had, a, um, we had in the past year at, Far at Rosalind Franklin University, we invited students who um, felt they were included in a particular group, and they self-selected that group to, um, to have listening sessions with the dean and with the um, uh, DEI officer for the university to talk about what made them feel included or excluded from within the curriculum. And so we had um, four groups and four two-hour listening sessions. And I learned a lot about what students really think about when we say that, um, that race drives treatment, whether that's in hypertension, you know, GFR calculation, or in pharmacogenomics. And I think that what we're seeing is a little bit of a pushback against this. So we're doing um, an analysis of all of our patient cases that we use in the curriculum to, uh, to make sure that we're doing race-conscious versus race-based teaching. So race-based teaching sets up race as being a predictor for a, a negative outcome, rather than being an indicator of underlying genetic or other factors or social uh, disparities that might mean this. And so um, setting this up, I think in pharmacogenomics, we have a really great opportunity to do this because it's a place where there's a very distinct ancestry and, um, and, and diplotype connection and, and prevalence of different alleles. And so I think we should think about this as an opportunity to help kind of lead the way in an area that is getting pushback from students and that I know personally has been an issue in our school. So we are reassessing all of our, um, all of our curriculum there and then also making sure that we're making those inclusive. Um, most different uh, ethnic classifications that are used are based on the Office of Management and Budget, and they're for U.S. breakdowns. And so a few years ago, PharmGKB switched to the standardized biogeographic classification system that reflects genetic diversity in different world populations. And I think that's a great way to frame that to students to say, you know, this isn't, it's not because of the race, that the race is indicative or maybe indicative of underlying risk factors or underlying genetic differences or um, uh, disparities. So we want to, I think, take that opportunity in pharmacy, and I want to just touch on that, or take that opportunity in pharmacogenomics to be able to, um, to, to reinforce that to students. And then the last thing that I'll talk about is kind of what we're doing at Rosalind Franklin. And so Rosalind Franklin University, as I mentioned, is a uh, gra graduate medical college in um, North Chicago. And um, it is known as being uh, one that promotes and has an excellent inter interprofessional program. So it's recognized as one of three programs of merit around institutional excellence and innovation by the um, uh, by the Association of, Association of Schools for Allied Healthcare Professions. And um, it's really what we're focusing on, what I'm doing there now, is launching a distinction that's interdisciplinary for, um, that will be on a student's transcript for precision medicine. So any student in the university, which would mean uh, nursing or psychology, would be able to enroll in this. And then there's a, there's a uh, three-year um, program where they would go through different seminars, an elective course, a project, and other things with me being kind of leading that. And that would allow them to get that interprofessional um, uh, distinction within their diploma. As I mentioned, we also are developing, looking at our educational initiatives for writing race and really explaining genomics to students early on so that they can understand a little bit more about health disparities and ancestry as opposed to race. So we're working on this. This should be launched um, uh, next fall. In the meantime, we have one uh, in pharmacogenomics for pharmacy students. And so I think there's an opportunity there to really um, to identify that within the university and really push that forward from an interprofessional way. I think at this point, what the conclusion that I've come to is that we've made a lot of progress, but we need to model our education on what we see in practice now. So looking at what the roles are in practice and defining those, I think is an important element of this, and then modeling our educational strategies on that, I think will help us to move further when it comes to translating um, education into practice. And so, um, and I think that's all. I apologize if I missed salient points. <laughs> so, but thank you very much. Thank you.